Atlanta, this is a young man that grew up outside of Philadelphia, went up to school in Boston, and now will be headed to learn how to speak with a slight southern drawl. And I think, Boom, for Arthur Blank, turn the page. It's a new era now of Atlanta Falcon football with Matt Ryan at the helm. You talk about a kid who carried a football team that did not have great receivers, a great offensive line, or great running backs. Matt Ryan, you talk about his size, 6'4 and 3 quarters, at that 220. With the sixth pick in the 2011 NFL Draft, the Atlanta Falcons select Julio Jones, wide receiver, Alabama. So Julio Jones coming to the stage. This breaks the hearts of some Rams fans that hope that he possibly could drop to them down all the way to 14. It also leaves Blaine Gabbert up for grabs for the 49ers who are now on the clock. As we all create some headspace for those developments, tell me about Julio Jones, Mike. Andy White, Tony Gonzalez, Matt Ryan is ecstatic right now. What a what a trade they pulled. Michael up. Turner, Julio Jones, Roddy White, Tony Gonzalez, Matt Ryan. That's not a bad nucleus to move forward. We're going to take a break when we come back. With the first pick of the fifth round, number 137 overall, the Atlanta Falcons select Grady Jarrett, the defensive tackle from Clemson. Rise up, rise up. All right, there you have it, Grady Jarrett. As we discussed before, a uh, big favorite of Dabo Swinney, and he would argue, too, that that guy causes the kind of confusion up front that allows some of the other playmakers on that defense to make hay. Grady Jarrett needs to play in a penetrating scheme, but when he does it, he is dynamic. He is short, but plays with great leverage, plays with great balance, and look at him chase from that nose position. He will not give a center a break at all. What's good? How y'all doing this evening? Welcome back to the Forever I Love Atlanta Sports Podcast Draft Prospects Show. It's your boy, The Dunn. I'm here with my co-host, King. What's good, man? What's good, Don? How's your day been today, bro? Hey, man. It's been great, man. It's been great. <laughs> I feel you on that. Great Friday, you know, off this weekend. So, you know, spend some time with the family. Yeah, you got to do that, man. You got to do that. Most definitely. We also welcome uh, by Georgia Sports Hospitality Media's own Tyler Crowder. How you doing, man? What's up, Don? Man, I'm doing good, man. Thanks for having me on. Thank you for uh, making it, man. Appreciate you, man. And our special guest that we have on tonight from the Draft Network, we have the one and only Jordan Reed. What's good, man? What's going on, fellas? It's a pleasure being here. Hey, man, it's a pleasure you coming home, man. We really appreciate this, man. Absolutely. Can't wait to get started. Let's get to it. Let's get to it. But hey, before we do it, y'all already know, if you're new to the channel, y'all already know what to do. Hit that subscribe button. We at 2.1K. We done grew. Thank you guys for the support. We appreciate it. All right? Also, hit that like button. Check this content out of Atlanta Sports Fanatics. And hit us up in the comment section, as always. Come holler at your hometown sports podcast. All right. Um, before we get into the show, let's go ahead and um, get our sponsorship out of the way. This show sponsored by Manscaped. All right. Support for Forever I Love Atlanta Sports Podcast is brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. 
Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels. They obsess over the technology development to provide you the best tools for your grooming experience. Manscaped trusts about over 2 million men worldwide. Join the movement for all your below the waist grooming needs. Man, as y'all know, I've been manscaping, um, bought me some more uh, products. I finally got my nose hair trimmer. So I'm about to use that. I'm going to use that tomorrow. Um, I told you, man, it's good. Yeah, so I'm gonna be using that tomorrow, and um, I'll let y'all know on Sunday how my nose feel. Um, of course, y'all know I like my uh, ball toner. Uh, that's my that's my thing. It's working pretty well. My ball deodorant is working pretty well. Um, what about you, Don? Hey, man, I can't say enough about the nose trimmer, man. I use that thing at least two or three times a week, and you know the uh, lawnmower uh, three point oh. Hey, I use that well, probably once a week. So hey, it's it's great to use. Speaking of the I have, I, have not, I have yet to hurt myself or nick myself or anything. Yeah, because you're probably using the right. You read the directions. Read. Yeah. Speaking of the, the lawnmower 3.0, it took them eight months to make that uh, lawnmower, 18 months to make that lawnmower 3.0. The third generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents. Advanced uh, skin safe technology pioneered by Manscaped. When I tell you this is premium, I mean premium. The battery will last up to 90 minutes. Take your time, people. Take your time. Don't be trying to rush yourself. That's how you nick yourself. That's how you cut yourself, and it's going to hurt. The waterproof technology allows you to groom in the shower. So take your time in the shower. Uh, run out the hot water if you need to. Uh, one of the coolest features in this lead light with the uh, aluminum groom areas for close and more precision uh, trimming. So, you know, just like I always say, the barber got the light to get that good lineup, get you a good lineup down there. If you want to put designs, do your thing. You can do that with the uh, lawnmower 3.0. 7,000 RPM. So if you cut yourself, it's going to hurt. Um, let's not forget it has a charger stand, so you can just put it on the port, charge it up. That's how I keep mine. Uh, trim that junk of yours. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code FILASP2021. Hey. Remember, use that code, you guys, F-I-L-A-S-P-2021. All right. So, what's good, Knight? What's good, nice. Trev? Uh, he said, what's up? Uh, what's up, another Falcons from live? Just enough Matt Mike's. It's a good Friday. Yeah, it is a good Friday, man. Appreciate you, man. JF, man, what's good, man? I ain't seen you in a minute. Thank you for joining, man. Say, man, I remember when there was like 80 subs or something super low, like the 2K. That was wild. Hey, man, we 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 growing over here, man. You've been gone for a minute. Hey, but hey, you was one of the originals, and we appreciate you st uh, sticking sticking with us. All right, so let's go ahead and get into Zayvon Collins. All right, so strengths and weaknesses. Let's look at these real quick. What's up? Mouse convert. All right. So the strength, he has great size. He's very versatile. Run. He's a good, great run defender. He's good in pass coverage. Good at rushing the passer and good tackler. So pretty much, he's he's pretty much a. I ain't saying average, but he's like a jack of all trades type of linebacker. Um, Jordan, I know you you uh you written a piece on um Collins, and this is one of the main reasons why I asked you to come on. Like, describe the, all these good uh, strengths that he has. Yeah, and I mean, there's plenty to go around about him, and you know, two games that really stood out about him or from him were Tulane and then also Oklahoma State, which was the season opening game. For him. And the first thing that really stands out about him is just his size. That's six foot four, 260 pounds. He's more of a bigger type of linebacker. And I think he can play all three spots. He can play Sam, Mike, or Will, and which is what he did at Tulsa. He pretty much was their defense in a sense. And Tulsa really hasn't had a big time defender come out of their school in a really long time. And I think Zavin definitely can be uh, one of the first rounders that they have had there in a long time. But he reminds me a lot of Anthony Barr coming out of UCLA. Yes. To kind of kind of paint a picture of what he could be. Um, I would like to see him be a little bit more physical. I think he does shy away from contact a little bit as far as uh, welcoming guys in the hole and then taking on that that uh, that contact at the engagement point. 
But I think it's just a matter of him just getting more reps and getting more comfortable at that position. But he also can blitz off of the edge. He also can play some defensive end as well. Now, he doesn't have – he isn't a super season type of pass rusher as far as he's not going to have that hand creativity like you see some of these guys coming off the edge and using their hands really well. He's not Dante Fowler or somebody like that coming off the edge. But as far as having that explosiveness and that up-the-field burst to be able to get to the quarterback, he definitely is that. I know that you brought up Dante Fowler. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> I don't even want to talk about that. Don't we love him, though? I thought we loved Dante Fowler. Who was we? <laughs> Who was we? Now, I, I, I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt. I'm going to give I'm gonna get Dante the benefit of the doubt on the Dean piece. I think he'd be a better player on the Dean piece. Yeah, all right. Vic, coaching Vic, does matter. You know, coaching does matter in, in the NFL. So, right. um, Yeah. All right, can, all right, can you go over his weaknesses uh, for everybody? All right, so his weaknesses. Um, he's not fast. He's not really fast. Um, uh, unofficial 44-8. So, you know, that's a little a little bit on the slow end. So um, coverage is going to be bad. I wouldn't say bad, but it's not going to be good, um, which comes to if you got a fast tight end, you don't want those problems. Um, so him being um, – a coverage linebacker is a weakness. Um, his misdirection and play action can get him confused sometimes, and he over overlooks a play or he misses the play because he's watching everything else that's going on. Um, but the biggest weakness is the the change of direction and the man coverage and the speed. Um, the misdirection and play action you can um, you can work on that, but you you can get faster. But usually your speed is your speed. Um, mm -hmm. So. That's going to be the biggest problem for him in the NFL is the speed of some of the tight ends, the speed of some of the running backs um, that he will have to cover. Uh, in the NFL, you got to do a lot of coverage. It's, you, it's going to be times you have to cover cover guys that are fast. So we already have Deion Jones, uh, who's fast. Foyer's not as fast as Deion, but he can keep up. Um, this guy would just be – that's the only thing I don't like about him is that speed and his quickness the sideline to sideline linebacker mentality. This is why I just have him. If we, if we plan at 34, I just have him just rush the passer. And if he do try to cover, I, I just have him cover the flat. That's, that's all you going to cover is the flat. <laughs> that's it. Uh, what about you? What about you, Jordan? Jordan laughing. <laughs> what you think? I think y'all kind of knocking him a little bit more. Uh, than what I, I kind of saw on film, I, I think speed. He's probably he's probably a four six guy if I had to guess right now, um, just because if you go back and watch him last year, he looked to play a little bit faster than what we saw a couple years ago from him. And it's just a matter of him being able to process the game a little bit better and things slowing down for him. But I think you're spot on with the misdirection and the play action. I think he kind of gets so aggressive at times. Te teams kind of like. They put that eye candy in front of him with those motions and those jet sweeps. And he, he gets kind of susceptible to that. And he kind of, what I like to call, take the cheese a lot. So he leaves his gaps voided a lot. Uh, that happened quite a bit in the two-lane game, even though he did finish strong in that game. They were able to target him a little bit and take advantage of him on some of those jet sweeps and those quick motions prior to running the ball the other way. So uh, I think coverage, he, he's gotten better at it over time. But like you guys said, I think it still should be labeled as a weakness for him right now. But it's just a matter of him finding a home and then just getting extended reps with doing so. But I like the player overall. I think he can be a, a versatile chess piece for you, but you just have to find a home for him and let him stick there first before you start to put more stuff on his plate. All right, Tyler, what's your thoughts on uh, Collins? Yeah, I, I liked what I saw on tape out of uh, Collins this year. Uh, of course, he was the you know, best linebacker in the nation this year, had four, I think four and a half sacks, also four interceptions. And that two-lane game that Jordan's talking about had the game-winning interception uh, in overtime, took it back to the house. So uh, he looks like a guy who's probably played a little bit of offense probably in his high school career. Uh, wasn't a highly touted guy coming out. So I think that he kind of worked with that chip on his shoulder. And uh, he is he's a little bit more versatile, I think. Uh, you know, once you watch the tape, he's able to do some things. He's going to hit you. Uh, once you get in that hole, he's going to come up and hit you. I, I really like the Anthony Barr comparison um i really like that comparison by jordan and uh, i really like collins in that 16 to 25 range uh somewhere in the first round 
a team that really sticks out to me that could use a guy like Collins, uh, who may be use, losing a guy like Bud Dupree, uh, is the Pittsburgh Steelers. I think he would fit in really nice with what the Pittsburgh Steelers do. Now, they're going to have holes on the offensive line, maybe looking at a quarterback and, and things like that. But I think he really would fit in with what they like to do there in Pittsburgh. Uh, but I really like what I saw to Collins this year on tape. A guy I heard about a little bit uh, later on in the process, only watched a few games of him on film, but he pops off right away. So, uh, you know, like like he said, Tulsa doesn't uh, put out a lot of guys defensively, but really like Collins. Uh, he, he is a dual threat kind of Swiss Army knife guy. Not great in anything, but really good at a lot of stuff. All right. That, hey. And that's the thing. I, when I watch the tape of him, and this is before I even went on draft process, draft um, network to read on um, Collins. And I watched the tape, and I'm like, "Yeah, he played. He plays a lot like Anthony Barr." Mm-hmm. You know, and I'm and I went on there. And I read Jordan. I'm like, "Wow!" Pretty much took the words out of my mouth. But hey, you know, when you watch film and you looking at everything, and you know, let's say the eyes and they all agree on the same thing. You know, it has to be true. So, all right. All right. So let's talk about the scheme fit. All right. You said um, Collins projects favorably uh, to a defense that's multiple with its alignments that presents the opportunity for him to unleash the full beneath of his skill set. That right there tells me a lot. Because Dean Pease, our defensive coordinator for the Falcons, he said that they they're gonna play multiple fronts. We're gonna play three four. We're gonna play four three. And I'm hoping that we play more three four. So I think Collins will will if we think about drafting him, I think he'll fit in the scheme. Because you know if we if say for instance on one play we play four three. Okay, well, you can have him, and you can have him as a DN. Okay, we go three four. Okay, well, you just move him to the outside linebacker. What's your thoughts on that? Yeah, he, I think he's a guy who can play, uh, like you said, that Sam or that Will. Uh, I, I'm not sure he's a middle linebacker. I think he's more of a kind of an outside linebacker, uh, like you said, Don. He can go. He can get after the quarterback a little bit, but. He's going to he's going to come up and hit you. He's going to um, take these, you know, blocks from the he's going to come in there and, and take these blocks from the outside uh, tackle and things like that. And I really like Collins. Uh, I just like the way he comes up and hits you in the hole. Uh, he can drop back. I mean, the guy had four interceptions last year, uh, took a couple back to the house. So I think he fits well in that kind of a Sam or Will linebacker. Uh, but like you said, he can also uh, come down and uh, play that outside three, four as well. That's what I'm thinking. Like he can, I know in the three four in the four three, in the four three, I'm pretty sure I can put him in the end. He has the size to do it. You know, what's your thoughts? What's your thoughts on that, Jordan? Yeah, and that's why I said he, he's really schemed at first. Yeah, I think you could play him on the weak side or the strong side in the four three. And I agree with Tyler. I don't think he's a middle linebacker just because of some of the, the processing issues that he does have. And then I think he could be an outside linebacker. In a three four, and it's funny that you guys mentioned that. I was listening to a Terry Fontenot a couple of days ago uh, on a podcast, and they were talking about he was mentioning that they were going through their scouting meetings and they were meeting with the coaches about what type of players that they want. And he said it was Dean Pease's turn to speak, and the story was pretty funny. So Dean is going down the list of the players that he wants, and he was like, "Well, I coached Ed Reed and I coached Ray Lewis. I would love to have." Those type dudes and Terry was like like Dean. There's only like those those are the only two guys that are like that. Grace exactly. Earth. So I don't know what they expect me to do. So I thought that was pretty funny. But yeah, I think Zavin could be he could be a Will or a Sam uh in a four three, but also he can play outside linebacker in a three four where you drop him into coverage, covering the flash like you guys mentioned, but also rushing the passer too. All right. I, well, yeah, I agree. Um I'm more so of uh I think he should play DN. Um, I don't think he should play outside linebacker unless it's the right. He has the right things around him. Um, I like him just like Don said to come in and rush the passer and only play the flats. So 
I don't think if he has to cover it, I'm I know Jordan, you telling us that he a four six guy, but from what I've seen, I just I don't I'm scared <laughs> to put him in coverage at any level. So I'm just going with a DN or playing a flat type of guy. Now, and he's all over the field, though. When you plug in that tape, uh, I'm sure Jordan's watched a lot of tape on him. I mean, he flies around. Uh, he does, He does. you know, get a little bit of too aggressive at times. And he's always of, around the ball. Yeah, and that, that ball. motion that you were talking about, he kind of does fall for the cheese a little bit here and there. And we know in the yeah. NFL, uh, the best offensive coordinators always have that pre-snap motion going on, um, you know, all these little wrinkles here and there. So uh, he's got to be more sound. Uh, but I think coaching, once he gets in the NFL – uh, he's already a big guy, 6'4", 240. Um, so, I mean, I think that once you get once you get him as, as kind of a film junkie getting in the in the, in the the room and then he, he, if he has some linebackers, say he went to the Falcons, he's going to have a nice linebacker group to work with. I think that's big too. Uh, what, what kind of supporting cast is he going to be around? Is he going to have to be a guy uh, like Zach Cunningham when he came in the NFL for the Texans? Had to do a lot of it himself. That's another guy he kind of reminds me of a little bit as well. Um, so I, I really like Collins. Um, I, I saw someone say, you know, where are y'all projecting him? I, I see, like I said, I think he's anywhere from a, you know, mid to late first round pick. Could slide a little bit, maybe early second round, but I don't see him lasting past, past 35. Yeah, you uh, just said the words. Yeah, I, would, I was literally just going to say that. I was going to uh, answer uh, JF uh, question. Guy, I, I can project him going somewhere in the late, between the late teens to like the early second round, like, and even going in the second round, they two guys be shocked if he's still on the board. Like, I feel like he should be, be he should be, he should be drafted. I say the sweet spot twenty two to twenty six in that in that range. That's just me. Tyler, you said earlier about good offensive coordinators um, having pre snap motion. Is that the reason Dirk Cutter didn't work out? I don't even <laughs> want to talk about Dirk Cutter, man. Don't get me started on that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Dirk Cutter was just a few years behind, I feel like. Uh, the he is. <laughs> Decades behind. The <laughs> best <laughs> offensive coordinators in the league right now, Sean Payton, Sean McVay, Matt LaFleur, all these guys, they use all these different wrinkles. They make everything look the same. They make the zone look the same. They make the play action. They make the bootleg all look the same. And why we didn't run a screen, I don't even know if we ran any screens with the running backs ever last year. And, and that's just a that, that's a part well, of the game hold on, hold on. have to have. Hold on, what keyword you just used in that in that statement you just made? Um, we did. I don't think we did at all. I don't nope. think we, what? Go ahead, say it. Go ahead. What was I gonna? Well, I don't. I don't. I'm not sure, Don. I, I, I may have. I may have been talking a little too fast. I missed it. Run. Yeah, is the keyword. Did we even run? I we don't even know what a run play is in a lot like last year. We ain't run for nothing. Yeah. You know what else you did? You you didn't say when you said offensive coordinators, Eric the enemy. Yeah, I'm just it, I'm that's just another one. You're right. That's <laughs> another one. Andy Reid. I mean, the top five guys in the NFL. I think it's all kind of universal. Uh, those kind of guys, they run the same kind of schemes, and and, and it's all about schemes. And and you, Don said it earlier. You got to have good coaching in the NFL. Yes, you got to have good players, but it, a lot of it comes down to coaching and scheming and and getting your guys in the right position. So. Uh, I think if, if Collins can go to a team with a nice defensive coordinator and some nice pieces around him, he could really flash in his first year. And that's why I like Pittsburgh. I think Pittsburgh is a team to watch out for Collins uh, with a guy who could lose D Bud Dupree on the outside, uh, you know, pair him with a J.J. Watt and some of these other guys, M Mika Fitzpatrick. I mean, this, I mean, he can fly around the football. So I think 24 right there, I think that's about the furthest he'll slide in the draft. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Tev, I am watching the Hawks lose. Um, 107, 118 is right now. 25 seconds left. Um, you already know if you watch the show, Fire LP. We on the train, so um, we ain't talking Hawks. We talking draft prospects, and I'll see y'all on Sunday. <laughs> All right, 2020 stats uh, for uh, Collins. He had 54 total tackles, 7.5 tackles for loss, uh, four sacks, Four interceptions, two pass defended, uh, two forced fumbles, one fumble recovery, and two touchdowns. Those are good stats right there. 
like that for pretty much an overall typical, you know, linebacker. Um, something about Zaven. He played in high school. He played DB and linebacker. Um, now defense defensive coordinators will love to use him a lot in different places, as he has had um, the capability to change plays with the, uh, his pressure. Um, <clears throat> talk about that, um, Jordan. Like. Defensive coordinators on um, how the way they utilize it. Yeah, so I mean, there's different ways that you can utilize Collins, and like I said, I think he reminds me a lot of Anthony Barr coming out. And if you remember, Barr was actually a running back when he first got to UCLA, and then he transitioned to the defensive side. He played defensive end primarily, and then it surprised a lot of people to see him move back to the second level and play. He's played primarily Sam linebacker with the Vikings so far, so. That's why I think with athletic guys like that, I don't think he's nearly as explosive as Anthony DeBar was just coming off the edge, but just painting a picture of like the kind of role that he could play in the NFL. I think he can play Sam linebacker. He can play Will linebacker too. But if you want to rush him off of the edge, if he does struggle, if he continues to struggle, diagnosing and reading those plays, I think is a situation of like some of you guys mentioned earlier of where you just want him rushing the passer just because that minimizes his thinking much more than opposed to uh, where he has to like read his keys, read run, and then drop back in coverage. He doesn't really have to do that as much as a defensive end. You kind of just tell him to go hunt, especially on third down, which is his specialty. Oh, man, that's music to my ears right there. Third down and, and getting the sack. Yeah, we really know what that is here in Atlanta? <laughs> that is beautiful. We can, we can get to the quarterback on first down and, and, and second down, but third down – it's like we forget Paradise how to we forget how to get to the quarterback. <laughs> Paradise, man. They be sitting back there making popcorn, watching movies, calling the girl, talking to mom. Uh, all right, twenty yard play. Like, come on. I'm hey, talking about like right. quarterbacks back there. They 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 finding the cure for COVID. I'm like, <laughs> hey, it ain't nothing like us playing prevent on third and twenty. I mean, I hate I hate the prevent defense. I'd rather you just go get the quarterback or just play your base. I hate that prevent stuff on, on third and long. I don't like third that. to twenty, third third to twenty eight. Like we we gave up <laughs> a first night. Like how you how can you? I'm like giving the guy twenty it. yards of separation. I mean, it's just yeah. Hey. We didn't go. We didn't. Be, we got to be aggressive on the money down. Third yeah. downs where you make your money at in the NFL. And you know what's crazy about that? It makes it look like that sack didn't count when. You get a sack on second down and it's third and 18 plus or third and 15 plus, and they get a 20 yard play. That sack really meant nothing. Yep. It's like, That's why third down, third downs are your money downs. Mm -hmm. This is where you make the plays to get off the field. Yeah, that's true. But they make players like Grady Jarrett, who just got that sack on second down. It's like, all right, but it makes it look like his, his sack didn't matter. But it did because that's a big play. So it just sucks when you go to pre prevent defense on third and 12 plus and they get 20 yards on it. So this is why some I look at pressure rates and sacks for each down, but I look mostly and I zero in on third downs. And this is why I saw that shit for the Falcons. And I'm like, man, we are horrible. We're that bad. We're that bad on third downs. Yeah. That pressure, I don't like that pressure stat. I really think it's pointless. <laughs> I don't pressure's like to me, pressure's only good if you if you single it out an individual. You looking at pressures for teams, I just it's 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 a to me this I'm not saying it's a meaningless stat, a stat, but it just okay. We we we're we're generating pressure as a team, but is that generating to sacks? My my thing with the pressures is Tap and Vic get a lot of pressures, and you see where they're at. Mm -hmm. Hey, uh, Jordan, uh, one of our listeners, Charleston, he got a question for you. He asking like, where's the podcast on uh, Terry Ford? No, go uh, ahead. Yeah. yeah, and I forgot to mention my bad on that. So it was the um, Huddle and Flow podcast with Steve Weish and then also Jim Trotter. Both of those guys work for NFL Network, and they have some really good interviews on there but um terry was kind of staying close to the vest with everything they kind of tried to pressure him a little bit they asked him straight up like i mean what's gonna happen with matt ryan and julio in the mm -hmm. next few years or so and he was just kind of staying close to the vest so they kind of they kind of tried to pressure him 
a little bit, but he stayed close to the vest about everything. But you could tell that he's a very, very intelligent dude. All right, since you brought that up, what's your thoughts on Matt Ryan? <laughs> uh oh, I like Matt Ryan. I'm a, I'm a fan of Matt Ryan. Um, he, he had the huge year with Kyle Shanahan, and I think people after that kind of set unrealistic expectations for him. They were expecting him to repeat some of that stuff, but I think Matt Ryan is the first. I wouldn't say the fur- furthest, but I don't think he's the problem in Atlanta. I still think he has some good years left in him, maybe two to three, but. Uh, I actually tweeted this out today. If they have an opportunity to take a quarterback, they should still do that, though, just because the biggest weapon in roster building in the NFL is having a cheap quarterback. So if a Justin Fields is staring at you there with the fourth pick, I don't see how you can pass that over. You got a kid coming back to his home state. Uh, I think you can really drive some attention back to Atlanta. Um, I know I'm getting you guys riled up a little bit about that, but uh, I think Justin Fields would be a, a great fit. Um, I think I just don't think um, even though Atlanta has problems, they have problems at edge rusher. Everybody knows that. Know. Probably need another corner. Need another corner. I would say the agent is probably safe, more safe, help. Safety's gonna uh, be in the secondary. Yeah, yeah. It, nothing matters in the NFL until you get the quarterback spot right, though. And Matt Ryan, he's not a problem in Atlanta right now. But we know when these when these quarterbacks get old, they fall off a cliff. Unless your name is Tom Brady. Mm-hmm. Outside of that, these guys are falling off a cliff. And I just think with a new regime. Terry Fontenot, if they want to generate some type of excitement with this team, I think you have to take a guy like a Justin Fields or if they want to trade back and get a guy like Trey Lance. I think Trey Lance would be a great fit in Atlanta as well. Before you go, Don, wait, let me let me say this. I go, ahead. Go, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I got a question, and then I'm going to uh, start out from the top. So anybody but Justin Fields, I'm going to start there. <laughs> I just feel like Justin Field. I, I don't think he's going to be a good quarterback in the NFL. But you said unrealistic uh, expectations from Matt Ryan. What do you mean by that? Well, so everybody thought that he was going to repeat the MVP year like he had with Kyle Shanahan. And I think with Kyle Shanahan, he's known as getting the best out of his quarterbacks. So once Shanahan left and he was the head coach for the 49ers, a lot of people were expecting him to repeat that same type of year. That's why I said he, it was kind of unrealistic expectation. He kind of did, though. He kind of did in yeah, 2018. He, did. he had the same yeah. number of stats. It just – the overall team was trash. Defense was horrible, yeah, I, coaching, you know, but he I still – he replicated that number. Yeah, I think the biggest issue in Atlanta was just they just needed a culture change, man. Like, they're known for blowing games. I think the message with DQ just got stale. And they just need a change of scenery. And we saw the success they had with Raheem Morris, even though they didn't win a bunch of games. You saw that, like, they believed in Raheem. And they seemed to play harder for Raheem, in my opinion, even though he didn't get the head coaching job. But you just saw when there was a new voice in their ear, they played harder. That's just me from the outside looking in. Now, I didn't see a whole bunch of games of Atlanta this year. But just looking from the outside looking in, I thought they played harder for Raheem. Uh, once they did uh, end up getting rid of DQ. But I just think they needed the culture shift of some kind just because the reputation with Atlanta is that they start strong, but they just don't finish games. And we saw that a lot throughout the year. And you guys have watched every single game. That's just been like the reputation for the Falcons ever since the Super Bowl. So I just think they just need a culture change of somehow. Quinn was never, Quinn was never really, to be honest with you, a proven guy for me. I never wanted him here to begin with. And I said before, before, before he was hired, before he was hired, some of the stuff. All right. All right. Yeah. yeah. I got a question real quick for Jordan. So, um, uh, all right. So, uh, basically, so, uh, they they hold on, hold on, hold on, yeah. hold on, hold on. It's an echo. Oh. It's an echo. Am I good? No. Go ahead. All right, Jordan. So, all right, Jordan. Uh oh. Wow. <laughs> Let me see. Hello? Hello? Hold on, hold on. Hello? Yeah, Tyler, it's your mic. Is that your mic? It's your mic. Is it me? 
Hello? Is it me? Um, um that's not the dog on shit. All right, I think we're good now. There we go. So, Jordan, man. Uh, you, Jordan, man. Go ahead. So, I think the Falcons pick at four, I think that's really the big question mark of this draft. Uh, I know you said you maybe like to see them go quarterback. If they don't go quarterback and they decide to go defensive side of the ball, who are some of your top defensive guys on this, on this side of the ball? Uh, I'm a big Patrick Sertain guy. Uh, I really like Patrick Sardane. I'm not sure I, about him at four. If you could trade back maybe to seven, eight, nine, really like that value right there, getting some extra picks. I'm also a big Micah Parsons guy as well. Who, who are your favorite defensive guys in this draft, Jordan? Yeah, I think it uh, how high he has some walk bills. Two as well, the event uh, when something that is really dealing off the field stamp, the linebacker. Yeah, yeah. Hey, Jordan. Jordan. Yeah, Jordan. I think it's your mic. Yeah. Um, try to uh, try to try to move. Try to uh, go down there. I don't think he, he, he. Now this is my mic. Okay, now this is working good. Mine's good too. All right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right, yo, you yo, good? Yo, yo. You good? All right. All right. So, Jordan, let's talk about. Back. What'd you say? Jordan's gonna come back. We're gonna get the show rolling, but until then, let's talk yeah. about. Let's talk about the mock. Too. Yeah. I'm bringing up my mock draft. Let's go. Hey, check. Check the uh, feel of Twitter and tell them to come back in like a couple minutes. I got you. Hey, right. now here's my mock for this week. As you can see, I did a lot of trades. Um, I know that first trade, y'all. Look, Duh, why you do that, man? The Broncos got just the feels. Okay, they can have them. <laughs> right. but the Broncos they gave me their first round, their second round, their third round, and then their second round for this year's round. Chicago, I traded with them, um, and they gave me their uh, their first. Well, they gave me we we, yeah, we swapped first rounds. They gave me their second and six. I traded with Tennessee, and I also traded with Miami. So the people I chose, the players I chose in the first round, I got Zayvon Collins from Tulsa. Of course, we talking about him tonight. Second round, shocker, I got Mac Jones from Alabama. So there's y'all quarterback right now. All right. Hold on, trap. Hold on, trap. Hold on. Hold on. You got Mac Jones. Yes. Name an Alabama quarterback that's been good in the NFL. Oh, um, got- let's see. No, 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 no. Stop, 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 stop. stop. <laughs> I got Tom Broadway Joe. Time. Who? Broadway, Broadway Joe. What draft was that? In the sixties. All right. Well, thank you. <laughs> But anyway, hey, um, so I also got in the second round Jalen Phillips and I got Landon Dickerson from uh, Alabama. Um, third round, I got uh, Tyler Shelvin. Y'all know I'm a huge Tyler Shelvin fan. I got Tyson Campbell, um, cornerback for Georgia, so hometown um, UGA uh, fans. Hey, we got a UGA. We got a Bulldog. And I got Paris Ford uh, for Pittsburgh. I got um, Edge Rusher for uh, Notre Dame, uh, Donkey Kuma, or Google something. Like, um, I got Dan uh, Moore Jr. from t- uh, Texas A&M. He's a good um, project um, t- offensive tackle. And I think he could be a good backup. I got Divine Diablo on uh, safety for Virginia Tech. I think he got great upside. Um, if he gets into the hands of a good defensive uh, coaching staff, I think he'd be real good. And then I got Nick Eubanks, tight end from Michigan. And I'm not trying to use my Michigan fandom um, 
to just hype up him. But for what Arthur Smith like to do with his tight ends, he will fit that scheme very well. And then I got Chris Evans, the running back from Michigan. So, and I think Chris Evans, if he has a good line, he can be a good serviceable uh, running back in the league. And the more I watch Phillips from uh, Miami, I really like his tape. Uh, he pops off a lot. Uh, a lot of the talk was about Rousseau at the beginning of the season who opted out. Uh, but I think Phillips' stock is rising. Uh, I feel like if we could, if we could, if the Falcons could land him in the second round, either at thirty-five or a trade back, that would be a really ideal situation. Uh, getting Phillips there in, in the second round, Don. I agree. I only, agree. Only uh, problem I have with your mock uh, draft is Mac Jones. That's the only problem I have. <laughs> hey, hey, no. I try to, I, I try, I try to give. <laughs> The fans, you know, some type of hope of us getting the quarterback in the first two rounds. Understood, but just not one from Alabama. <laughs> you can't just judge the, the, the place they play at, man. I know even yeah, though, yes. Yeah, I can. <laughs> they oh. have, you just said 1960. <laughs> no. Hey, but look, look though, before before Carson wins, who was really drafting quarterbacks out of uh, North Dakota State? You are, you are absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But Mac Jones had a great offensive line. He had good wide receivers and a stellar defense. But you also got to look at this, too. Look at how he, how he goes through his reads, how he progresses reads. Okay, we said the same thing about Tua, and the Dolphins are currently man, no, come on. quarterback. <laughs> oh, come on, man. Tua, really? Okay, I'm just saying. Okay, with that man, yeah, go on. Who's the last good Clemson quarterback to come out before Deshaun Watson? Hey, Deshaun Watson's on another level. What about Texas Tech with Patrick Mahomes? Okay, (laughs) I just don't like Alabama. You got to scout the player, not the school, man. Yeah, I I look at you. Right, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right about that. I just don't like Alabama quarterbacks. I'm gonna be honest. (laughs) <laughs> hey, hey, I like the running backs, so uh, yes. I just like the Alabama running backs. That's a, that's a factory right there, boy. I'm telling you. For sure. I like the Alabama running backs and the Alabama wide receivers. <clears throat> yeah. And uh, so, Jordan, back to the question from earlier, man. Who's your favorite defensive guy? We couldn't hear you breaking up a little bit earlier. Who's yeah. one of your favorite defensive guys, man? Oh, I have a lot. Um, I was talking about Michael Parsons a little bit. Um, I think he, he's a guy that – brings a lot of things to the table, you know, getting to know Micah a little bit during the process. I interviewed him uh, prior to the year uh, when he opted out. A really driven guy. I didn't know that he was a defensive end coming into Penn State. That's something that I learned new coming up, uh, coming through the draft process about him. He said, he said straight up to me, like, I'm more comfortable playing defensive end than linebacker. So, which makes a lot of sense. And if you go watch him in the bowl game last year against Memphis, where he had like 14 tackles, uh, interception. He was just all over the field. He went, ended up winning MVP of that game. I think that was one of the better games of his career. So I think four is probably a little bit too rich for him. But if they want to trade back and get some more day two picks, I think, you know, maybe that 10 to 15 range, I think I would be more comfortable taking him there. Uh, one, this corner class is really interesting. Uh, you hear about Sertain and Farley a lot, but I'm a big fan of J.C. Horn out of yeah. South Carolina. So I'm just a fan of guys that are just dogs at corners. And if you think about all the elite guys at the position, whether it's Jalen Ramsey or Jair Alexander, I kind of like, for lack of better terms, I like cornerbacks that are assholes, man. I love dudes that yes. are like that because you have to have that type of confidence at the position just because I think half the battle as a cornerback, especially as a rookie, is that you have to be confident at that position. And you see J.C. Horn going up into guys' faces, clapping at them like, yeah, like I'm ready, like bring it on. So I'm a big fan of J.C. Horn, and that's why I like him a lot. So let me ask you this. Um, with uh, Michael Parsons, would you? How would you feel if they drafted him and then just said, "All right, we're gonna put you at the end"? How would you feel about that situation? I'm fine with it. I mean, he, he's more comfortable at that position yeah. too. So, if a player is more confident at a position, you obviously want to put him in the best positions to succeed. And he's shown that he's comfortable at that position too. And he's a bigger linebacker. He's the same size as Zayvon Collins, believe it or not. Even though their build is a little bit bigger, he's about six foot four, two hundred and fifty five pounds. So he already has that natural build to come off of the edge. And he, he's super explosive, too. He's way more explosive than Zayvon Collins coming off the edge. He already has that natural bend 
in order to dip and rip and corner to the quarterback too. So I think it's a situation of some teams might actually have him graded as a defensive end. That wouldn't surprise me at all, just because the big thing with Micah is that he struggles processing things. Um, you see him, he's super athletic, but he'll be running the opposite way of where the ball is going sometimes <laughs> just because he, he's just not used to playing the position. And we know with linebackers, it's all about instincts. If you can't sit back there and read what's going on, like you can't be on the field just because you're going to put the defense in so many bad situations. So that's why I said some teams might actually have him graded as a, as a, uh, as an edge rusher. Yeah. He also played uh running back in college. I'm a big Michael Parsons guy. Um, I won't uh, want the Falcons to draft Michael Parsons first round, um, even if they had to trade back um, to get him. So um, the fact that if even if they draft to put him at the end, I'm happy. Um, so Dean Pease is a great guy, and he knows where players need to go. So if they draft and put him at the end, I'm happy. So. Right there with you. No problem. I have no problems with that at all. No. But I, I said this too. Um, Parsons, he he looks like a Dean Pease, Bill Belichick, um, Nick Saban type of player that they would love to have on their team because these guys they know linebackers. Yeah, and you know if you talk to Micah for two minutes, like the dude is a dog, man. Yeah, like he is. He let you know, like I am the best player on the field when I walk in the stadium, and that's the type of confidence that I have. And I, I just love players like that, man. Like he was one of my favorite players to interview this year. You could just feel his energy through the phone. And I love like defensive dudes. You want people like that, especially walking through the door as a rookie. He's got, he's not going to have any problems with feeling like he can be that guy on defense yeah. That's the type of way that he carries himself. We had somebody like that here um, last year. We traded him. Tech, Tech had the energy. Bruh. No, <laughs> no, I know you did not, Don. Don, Don. Don. I'm just saying, Don. Don. that's like, all he was. He was Don. 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 in the say? live, Don. In the live, brother. As, as hold on, what'd you, Jordan, what'd you say? I was saying Deion Jones is like that. He's a dog. I think he's yeah, Deion, Deion's a dog, but Ke Tack Keanu, Keanu Neal's a dog too. Yeah, but Tack Tack swore he was a dog, like. Cause after what you know, when he was drafted and everything, you know that what he did that you know draft night, everybody just thought, oh man, he good, he good. I'm like, okay, we gonna see. Yeah. Hey, hey, they drafted him before Tredavious White and J and uh, T.J. Watt. T.J. Watt. Shout out to uh, Dimitrov for that one, man. Wow. But uh, like you said, man, Jordan, he I think he's explosive enough to play uh, DN, but I think it, he gives that versatility. So he can play that outside linebacker spot, and he can come after the quarterback. And like you said, man, he's a dog. I feel like he would have maybe helped himself out a little bit playing this year, but he's most yeah. likely a top 15 pick. So, I mean, he's not going to lose too much money. But I feel like if he would have came out this year and really put out what he put his sophomore year tape out, he really could have been a, a secure top five pick. But I, I like I really like Parsons' tape uh, out of pretty much anyone on the defense. And then I'm a certain guy, man. I, I love the – the thought of pairing A.J. Terrell with Patrick Sertain. Now you're cooking with something. Uh, of course, the secondary has to be uh, addressed. Like we got to get a pass rush, though. Exactly. It's, good. it's good to have all those corners, but, hey, the corners can't cover forever. Yeah, and exactly. That's why the Falcons couldn't cover a lot last year because the, the guys have 10 seconds to throw the football. So I'm with you there. You got to address the you got to address the defensive line, edge rusher, either free agency we kind of missed on that. We've missed on them in the draft, too. But you got to get some guys who can get after the quarterback. But I feel like if you draft Sertain and pair him with A.J. Terrell, uh, that, that could be a nice, bright future for that secondary. Uh, and you could be looking at something like uh, like the Broncos had in 15 with uh, Harrison um, and Tlaib. Something something like that. Two guys who are dogs. Uh, Sertain's got the genes. I like it when a guy's dad is an all-pro at the same yeah. position. Talk about J.C. Horn. His dad played wide receiver, but he's got the genes in him, and and, and you can just tell he's got he's a, he's definitely Joe Horn's son uh, because uh, he he likes to talk a little bit. And uh, I'm sure you watch that Auburn film where Horn, I mean, he just was the best player on the field that day against Auburn. Uh, and then one more defensive guy for you, Jordan Asante Samuel Jr. Man, I really like what he's done. He he wasn't on a great team, um, but he 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 led the you know he had a lot of pass breakups. A lot of interceptions at Florida State, and I think he's a guy who's kind of creeping up a lot of draft boards as well. 
Yeah, and he's kind of been the forgotten guy in this draft class, not just the cornerback group. And he once again, he has the genes that you're looking for as well. And I think he's very comparable to Jadavius White coming out of LSU, and I expect him probably to go. Uh, maybe not as early as what Trey White did, but I think we could see him go somewhere early on day two. Very quick twitch. Um, I think he's phenomenal as far as uh, covering guys uh, on the perimeter. He has some nickel experience as well, which I think is pr pretty much a requirement for – Players of his size, a bit of a smaller corner, so you may have to transition him inside, but I think he can survive outside as well. Sertain, I think he's a really interesting case. I actually interviewed his dad last week for a story that I was working on. So just sitting down, like listening to him talk, I could listen to that dude talk all day. And it's like, like, damn, man, I'm on the phone with Patrick Sertain, a dude I grew up watching. Him and Sam Madison was my favorite cornerback combo to use on Madden. Like both of those dudes was always great. So just yeah. listening to him talk ball and just talk about Sertain. He's still kind of in disbelief that he, that's his son. And he, he's a guy that's just – he's a really good player. Uh, the biggest concerns that you have about him is the catch-up speed and the deep speed. I think that's something that he has struggled with a little bit when guys have been able to get behind him. He's really struggled with catching back up to him. So he was one that I was really looking forward to seeing as far as his 40 time. I think he probably would have been a high 4-4, four, four, uh, low 4-5 guy. I think that probably would have been the the – a favorable range for him but as far as the player i mean i think he's a, f a fantastic player he's going to be a phenomenal pro as well it's just a matter of the deep speed that's the biggest worry with him um and then uh jc horn already touched on him as well so atlanta could be in the, i think atlanta's in a good spot uh if i had to guess right now they probably end up trading back just because i think somebody's going to come up and get one of those quarterbacks whoever's left between justin fields and zach wilson if miami does stick at three so they're in a good spot, man, uh, as far as everything that they need. I think it's a deep class outside of safety, outside of the needs that they do have. I think it's a deep corner class. It's a deep edge group. But safety is going to be a little bit tricky as far as when and where they want to take one. Yeah. And Atlanta kid, he just made it. Man, he said Casey moved to uh, free safety full time. Oh, Casey don't want to play safety. That's the thing. And if he can't – up, if he don't want to play safety – his contract already up anyway, so he can go on the bounce. Like we need some people. We need people that that who want willing to play a position that we need them to play. So, but um, I like what you just said about trading back. Cause this is this is the best scenario for me for the Falcons. Trade back, get more draft capital because we got so many holes to fill up. We've been talking about defense. You haven't even addressed left guard or running back. You know, those things that need to be addressed. And also, we need to bring – we need to draft a good kick returner or punt returner. We haven't had one since Allen Ross. <laughs> right? Like, for real, we need we need to, to get that taken care of. But um, if we stick at four and this player is still on the board, we got to draft him. And that's Penny Sewell. I love that man. Like, I love that kid. We need to draft him if he at four. But if they decide to trade back, then they trade back. feel like you get the best defensive player that's on the board, whether it's um, – it's, it all depends on where we fall. If if Parsons there, you get Parsons. If uh, Jalen Phillips or even um, David Collins or Gregory Russo, those guys, Russo's, I think he's, he's he can be a good uh, player in the league. Yeah, and, you know, it, it's going to be interesting just because uh, that's why I said Atlanta's in a great spot just because they have so many different directions that they could go. They could trade back. They could take Parsons. They could take Sewell. There's so many different ways that they could go, but I'm right there with you with Sewell. I think he's going to be a phenomenal player. He can play guard or he can play tackle. It really doesn't matter. He's a plug-and-play guy, and I think he's going to end up being an all-pro for somebody, and that's the type of offensive lineman that you want to take early on. And, you know, I like to make the comparison of him to Quentin Nelson as far as how they can change the identity of an offensive line, and we see what Quentin Nelson has done. He's probably on track right now to be wearing a gold jacket here 10 to 15 years down the road from now, just how well he's been playing early on. So I think Sewell can have a, a similar type of impact. I, I, I highly agree with you on that. Um, I know we we talk, we talk about linemen now. What's your, um, what's your thoughts on uh, Elijah Vera Tucker? Love him. One of my favorite players in this draft. And, you know, I was talking to some scouting buddies the other day about him. And the great thing about him is that 
he dominated his first two years at guard. And it was surprising to a lot of people that they shifted him out to tackle. But he went out and dominated at that same position as well. He's a bit of a smaller tackle. He's about six foot four, about hovering around 300 pounds. But he has that guard tackle flexibility. And I think he can even play center if he wanted to. So he's checking off so many boxes. And then he's always in control. He's super mature. Um, and then he's, he's a very young prospect as well. I think he's still 21 years old right now, which matters a lot to me, especially at a position like that, the uh, offensive line. Those guys can play forever. But whenever you can get a young one like that, that is already proven at multiple positions, which is what Atlanta needs. He's played left tackle, and then he's also played left guard. So even if you want to slide Jake Matthews in inside, and then you want to put Vera Tucker out on the perimeter, or if you want to keep Matthews out on at left tackle and you want to slide Vera Tucker in at left guard, you're starting to create some depth at certain positions. So I'm a big fan of Bear Tucker. Well, I, I, you know, I watched his tape, what, a month ago, and I'm like, hmm, Falcons do trade, you know, back and stay in the teams. They want to address that left guard position. I, I'll go ahead and get ABT. You know, you fortified your line. Um, and Arthur Smith, anyway, he's an offensive line uh, guy anyway by trade. You know, you just fortified your line. You go in the second round, you get a Javante Williams, yep. you know, who I love the most, you know, out of the running right, right backs. So, hey, what's wrong with Javante? There's nothing bad. wrong with Javante. I'm just a Sam Howell guy. Okay. <laughs> well, I love, I I love, love Sam awesome. Howell. I think Sam Howell should be the bet, should be the next quarterback for the Atlanta Falcons. All right. The Atlanta kid said, What's your opinions on the stat- status of Dave Matthews? He was a weak point until the line imploded. Yeah, well, I haven't watched like Atlanta super in depth, so I can't really speak as to like how well he played last year. But um, I mean, if there was one candidate to slide inside, it probably would be McGarry, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Just because I think he probably he's not as athletic as Matthews, just grading them on how they came out and just the athletic traits. But if they wanted to slide slide one guy inside, and then let's say they take an ABT, they could put ABT at right tackle, and then they move McGarry to left guard just because he's not a super athletic guy. He does struggle a little bit with speed off of the edge. I think that would be a really good mixture of what they wanted to do. And, and the thing is with Matthews, every year I see this. Like the beginning of the season, he kind of struggles, but when he gets his legs foot and right, you know, as the season progresses, he plays a little better. But Matthews, to me, he's a be- he's better at run blocking than than pass protecting. And <clears throat> I've been trying to tell people this, but when you have an offensive coordinator who wants to throw the ball ninety nine point eight percent of the times, ninety nine point nine. Okay, I, I was being a little generous a little bit, <laughs> but anyway. But when you have an offensive coordinator who wants to just throw the ball all the time. You pretty much making your line vulnerable, and then not only just that, the type of plays we running, we we doing these long developing uh, plays down the field, like you asking these guys, McGarry, who just who's a sophomore, you know, in his well, his sophomore season, you asking this man to, to be in pass protection a lot. That's not his. That's not his skill set. He's better at run blocking. Him and Lindstrom, but Lindstrom can do it all. Like, but still. If you want your if you want your off your young offensive lineman to develop, you gotta call a balanced play call. You gotta call a balanced um game plan. That just that just my take. Yeah, and I mean they're gonna run that ball with Arthur Smith. You better believe that, especially with the background that he came from and how he was designing so many things with Derrick Henry. So, like you mentioned, I do expect him to take a running back probably early. Um, Javante Williams, I think, could be a viable option for them. And I know some of you guys may not like him, but I think he's a baller. I think he's one of the better running backs in this class. Uh, I mean, Ty Gurley, he just wasn't it. He hasn't been the same since the knee injuries and then when he got the big deal. So I don't think he's going to be back. So Atlanta's definitely going to need, I think, a bell cow type of rusher. I think Javante definitely can be that. You're going to have to probably take him somewhere, um, probably in the top 60, the top 75 picks. I think he's probably going to go in that range just because I think Najee and ATN, they're probably going to go somewhere in the top 45 if I had to go, if I had to guess. So and I think Javante is probably going to be the next guy off the board after that. And, and George, Javante just broke another tackle, man. 
He just <laughs> broke another tackle. Guys, that break he, he breaks so many tackles. You watch him on film, it's it's unbelievable. <clears throat> I'm just gonna be I'm just gonna be honest with y'all. And for what I've seen, I yes, you got Najee, Etn, Javante. All right, and people are putting them in that order. But if you look at Etn and Harris, what do they have? What did they have had in their respective schools that um, Javante didn't have? <clears throat> Support and cast. Huh? Around, I mean, weapons around them. Um, that yes, a line. Yeah, Devontae true. didn't have all the offensive line in North Carolina. And I've been trying to tell people this. No, no. I'm like, look, if, if, if ETN and Javante on the board in the second round and we need to get a running back, I'm choosing Devontae. I'm 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 not even gonna say I'm sorry on that. And then because you you don't know you don't know how how Javante will perform with a better offensive line. And then at that spot too, you got to think about mileage as well. He's he, he split carries in the committee. We know with Alabama running backs, there's a lot of tread on those tires. Or excuse me, they have a lot of wear and tear on their body coming to the league. And then Etn, he was a senior running back, so he has a lot of wear and tear on his body as well. Javante, he split carries with another talented back in this group, named Michael Carter, which I'm sure you guys know about. He was in the committee already, and he still was able to shine. So I think you're getting a player that's really just scratching the surface of what he can be. Okay, I got another question for you. What What is your thoughts? Hey, everybody know what I'm about to ask right now. What is your thoughts on Quadre Otis? Uh, I mean, <laughs> let me ask you guys' his thoughts first about mm -hmm. him. I want to see what you guys say about him first. Under Man, he ain't getting no play time. <clears throat> yeah. That's what I was gonna say. It needs to just be utilized a little bit more. That's the biggest thing about him. So I like him though. Yeah, he did some good things coming out a couple of years ago, and yeah, just, I, don't, I just don't think he's been in the right fit. Uh, he could be a guy who could be, you know, that number two uh, running back for the Falcons, get you 500 yards, a couple touchdowns here and there. But um, so, so Don, you like you like uh, so you're you like Devontae Williams a little bit more than Etn. Yeah. And and I and I and I like him more as a running back, you know, carrying the football. Um, but man, Travis Etienne, and you tell me, Jordan, what do you think about this comparison? But when I watch Etienne, man, you know who he reminds me of? Alvin Kamara, and and, and that's a guy who he gets a lot of comparisons to, just because the, the way he can catch the football out of the backfield. Um, but that's my that's my comparison for him, and then my comparison for Najee Harris. I'm gonna go give you an old school running back right now. High and hot and likes to run high with the football. Eddie George, that's who that's who Najee Harris reminds me of. An Eddie George type running back. Uh, I got I got Harris at one, Etn at two, Javante not far far away at three. But I, I think I think Williams has kind of set himself up to be a, a day two pick, uh, kind of in that second round. We all know the value for running backs, though, has kind of decreased in the last few years. But uh, there's some there's some running back. I mean, Falcons could use a running back at 35 for sure. Um, so I would love, I mean, if they could. What's your, what's your comparison to Javante? My comparison for Javante? Um, I, 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 had, I did a running back draft thing last night, actually. And a uh, guy he kind of reminds me a little bit of, uh, maybe not as explosive, um, but a guy coming out of Clemson, you know, 10, 15 years ago, C.J. Spiller. He remind, he doesn't have that home run ability. Um, but, you know, when you watch him bounce off guys and then hit that second level, he reminds me a little bit of a C.J. Spiller uh, type guy uh, early on in his career, um, kind of with with Clemson coming out. That's guy he kind of reminds me a little bit of, uh, and I know that's a little, uh, you know, maybe a shocker to some people, but that's who, I watch him, and that's who he kind of reminds me of. Um, that run against Miami, man, was was unbelievable. All right, here's my here's my comparison to Javante. I say Frank Gore. Frank Gore. But I'm also leaning towards Jamal Lewis. Good comparisons. Good Somebody play. Charleston Nash said he, he he compares Javante to Jamal Charles. That's a good one. That's yeah, a good one. I don't think he's that fast though. Yeah. Jamal Charles was Yeah, Jamal yeah, Charles was fast, was but he can still run through people though. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, and you know, just touching on the ETN and then Camara comparison, I don't think he's as shifty as Camara. I think ETN is more of a straight line tackle breaker. 
than what Kamara is. You know, Kamara's making people miss in short areas. I don't think ETN – I wouldn't say he's not capable of doing that. I just don't think he does it consistently, but he's a very strong runner. And I don't think he's as good of a pass catcher as what Kamara is. And there's two types of running backs to me when it comes to receiving. Either you can really incorporate them in the passing game as far as just – put them on check downs, quick swings or bubbles of that nature, or you can revolve a passing game around him, which is like Alvin Kamara. He's isolating linebackers, putting them in a bind, uh, you know, making dudes miss like that. So I don't think ETN is that type of back, but I think you can basically fit him into the passing game, if that makes sense, just because that was the big question about him coming into his junior season before he made the big spike in production was that can this dude catch the ball consistently? out of the backfield he just wasn't able to do that but he made a big jump during his junior year and then he proved that he can consistently do it during the senior year as well all right all right well hey i think you got any more questions uh tyler no the only thing i'm, I'm gonna say the jordan real quick before we get out of here man the i think that the atlanta falcons should do exactly what they're doing now not saying not, not say very much get do the scouting they need to do on the at the quarterback position position and then, you know, just get that price up as high as you possibly can at four. Make everyone think that you're going quarterback at four and really drive that price up. And I think that would be the best case scenario for the Atlanta Falcons. Um, I know they have a lot of picks uh, in this draft. you got ten picks right now. But at the end of the day, you can maneuver around, trade up, use some of those later round picks to move up. I feel like if you can get two second round picks, maybe a third second round pick, you get top four picks in the 64 uh, for a team with so many holes. I really feel like they could really – you got to hit in this draft. Terry Fontenot has done a great job hitting in drafts with the New Orleans Saints. I know he would, uh, I know he had a lot to do with what they were doing. I'm not, he's not the only contributor uh, in the director of pro scouting, all that. But he had a lot to do with a lot of those selections. Uh, and then you look at the 17 draft where the Saints uh, – you know, Saints were 7-9, seven 7-9, nine, seven and nine, seven and nine. And then look what they did with that 17 draft. They were really able to turn things around down there in New Orleans. So drive that price up, man. And and uh, hopefully we can go get some playmakers. <clears throat> I've been saying that for a while now. That's what they're doing. They're playing poker real well right now with the league. And they're not they – yeah, anytime a pro day for a quarterback, they, yes, the Falcons will be on that list. Mm-hmm. Look on draft night, I'm telling people, don't be surprised if we trade back. Yeah, I'd like to stay in the top 10, though. Try to stay, uh, I think, Detroit at 7. I think Denver at 9. You got San Francisco at 12. I think those three are the real big teams to watch out for me for uh, on draft night. Carolina at 8, too. Yep. They're definitely in the quarterback race. To get yeah, some. I just don't know about trading with a division rival. But at the oh, same yeah. time, if you, you get a King's ransom, you got to take it. Yeah. yeah. King had to leave. Um, he got he, he got to get off early. So it, we'll be back on Sunday. All right. But uh, once again, uh, Jordan, man, it was a pleasure having you on. Once again, let everybody everybody know who you are. Everybody know who you're from. I'm going to let you go over and say it again. Let everybody know. Yeah, so you can find me on Twitter uh, at Jordan underscore Reed, J-O-R-D-A-N underscore R-E-I-D. You can find my work on the draftnetwork.com. we got a ton of stuff going on over there. If you guys want to put yourself in the shoes of Terry Fontenot, we have a what is called a mock draft machine. And, you know, you guys were talking about it a little bit on here. It's a really fun exercise, very addictive. Um, before you know it, you're doing hundreds and hundreds of mock drafts. Just There's so many different circumstances and situations that you can put yourself in. But the great thing about our mock draft machine is that you're not just clicking names. You can actually read scouting reports about these guys. We talk about scheme fits. Uh, we give NFL player comparisons. And then we just list our overall thoughts of what we saw when we were scouting all these guys. And it's not just you can read about Michael Parsons, but you can read about Division Two, II, Division Three, NAIA players. So we've touched over 500 prospects in the country already. So you can read about your prospects from your first round pick all the way down to your seventh round pick. So go ahead and check that out on the draftnetwork.com. And pay for the uh the, the, the pro is it called the pro subscription? Yep, the premium. premium. Subscription. Yeah, yeah, I'm a premium 30, member. Thirty dollars a year, very affordable. Yeah, it's what yeah thirty dollars a year. Yep. And being a premium member, it got all the uh, nice perks of the mock draft because you can trade, you can call trades up, trade downs, all that. Like, if you just have, you just want to be free, have it for free, 
you don't get that luxury. So, yeah, but I, I enjoy it though. But thank you again for coming on. Everybody who watching this at a uh, later time, make sure y'all hit us up in the comment section. Let us know what y'all think about Zayden Collins or anything that we mentioned on the show. If you're new to the channel, you already know what to do. Hit that subscribe button. Hit that like button. Share this content out with Atlanta Sports Fanatics. And hit us up in the comment section. As always, come holler at your hometown sports podcast. It's your boy, The Dunn, with Georgia Sports House Channel and Media uh, on Tyler Crowder. Appreciate you coming on. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. I thank you. And our special guest, um, Jordan Reed. Y'all have a great evening. Hey, y'all stay safe out there. Supposed to be a good day tomorrow in Atlanta, so that's that's a good thing. Y'all have a great evening. See y'all see y'all Sunday. <laughs>